Um, so I just want to say good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for our third webinar as part of our gardening series this fall. Uh, today's presentation is called the virtual garden kickoff. Usually uh, CalFresh does a lot of these in person all throughout the valley. Um, so we thought it'd be interesting during these times of COVID to do a virtual garden kickoff as well. Um, my name is Christian Salgado and I've been the host for most of these meetings. And I'm the community education specialist for the California Department of Food and Agriculture's UCNR Climate Smart Ag program. Uh, Shulami Shorter, who is um, also a community education specialist that works for the Climate Smart Ag program in Bakersfield, will be our co host today. Um, the intent of each webinar is that we build on the previous presentations. So if you've joined us for the past two webinars, uh, today we'll kind of be kind of bringing those two ideas together and continue building on your knowledge. If you, for some reason, are unable to attend, don't worry. Our webinars are recorded and posted on our UC Imperial website. Um, and I'll also share that as a follow-up email so you can access it quite easily. Um, okay, so a little bit more housekeeping. If you have any questions, please save them for the end of the presentation. The way you can ask us those questions is putting them in the chat. Everybody who's joined today's webinar is on forced mute. So you won't be able to communicate with us unless you put those questions in um, in the chat. And Shulami and I will keep track of those and read them to Chris at the end. So please save all your questions for then. Um, but if you type them up, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the, on the chat. So today's presenter, um, I'm really excited. He's an amazing gardener, a uh, native to Imperial County, um, is Chris Wong. And he works for the UC Imperial County um, extensions CalFresh program, but I'll let him introduce himself uh, a little bit better than I did. Okay, Chris, you're free to get started. Thank you, Christian. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Gomez Wong from the UC CalFresh uh, Healthy Living Program here at the UC Cooperative Extension um, in, in Imperial County. Uh, this is a garden, like Christian said, this is a gardening training that we provide to preschool teachers. Uh, every year um, during their October and February garden kickoffs um, at the ICOE um, sites. So just as a quick um, reference point, we work for the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources Center. And within that, uh, within the center, we have CalFresh Healthy Living Program, which is a program that I uh, work for. Um, but we work closely with 4-H and you might recognize the Farm Smart logo on the right. Um, we do nutrition education in schools, and we ex the reason why we garden um, is to extend the nutrition classes that we that we provide. Um, we also do a little bit of cooking classes, and we work off a volunteer extender model. So if there are any teachers out there, any community um, volunteers that are working or volunteering at an approved SNAP Ed site, we can work with you and provide technical assistance on starting a garden uh, to change the environment of your campus. Um, this is one of the sites that we work at. It's Calexico High School's Eco Garden Club. Um, we have students here gardening a little bit of cabbage um, and some broccoli. Um, and they're, they do everything from building their own beds to, to maintaining the, the irrigation cycles. They harvest, uh, they plant, germinate seeds, uh, and then they take it into the culinary class to cook with it eventually. Um, this is a little bit of the curricula that we use at the uh, sites that we're at. So the two on the left, Nutrition to Grow On and Twigs, are available for free. And Christian is going to link those in an email or uh, PDF. Uh, so you can get the link to those two free PDF files of our curricula. The one on the right, we can extend, um, but you can also purchase it for $50 from Texas A&M. And then the UC Master, we don't have a UC Master Gardener program in Imperial County, but this handbook is extensive. It's like this, it's like two inches thick. It's going to give you a very good, great reference point for any and all gardening needs in the state of California. Um, and you can order it on the link uh, provided as well. Um, so some of the benefits of gardening, the reason why our program gardens is we increase the children's exposure to fruits and vegetables. We believe that uh, if a student grows up eating, a, if they plant a tomato, they're much more likely to eat that tomato. It gets them physically active out in, 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 outside. It increases the vocabulary. They learn that a plant is not just a leaf. It's also maybe a spinach or a kale, and they can differentiate between the two. They can start counting the seeds that they plant. 
develops their fine and gross motor skills as they're planting those seeds with their fingers and they're also picking up maybe a bucket of water or, or digging into the soil. Um, and it exposes them to, to the natural life cycles, right? Uh, pollination, uh, things like that. So we highly encourage you all to garden with the little ones if you have them at home, grandchildren, kids, um, as much intergenerational gardening uh, as possible is uh, what we promote. The four things we tell our preschool teachers that they need for their gardens to be successful is soil, seed, sun, and water. We add a little bit of, we tell the kids, yeah, you need to add a little bit of love, the same way your parents take care of you. Uh, to grow big and strong, you need to take care of the plants to grow big and strong, so you need to show them a little bit of love. We add that to those four things, soil, seed, sun, and water. Starting off, we need, uh, starting off and focusing on our soil, we need to prep the soil as much as possible beforehand. Um, prepping your soil is going to set up the optimum growing conditions. If you plow it or till it, if you break it up as much as possible, um, it's going to allow roots to stretch out. It's going to allow water to drain. And if you water it a little bit before planting, it's going to promote uh, microbial life. And you'll get a chance to pull out any baby weeds that come up. Um, but prepping the soil is one of the most important steps. Um, we tell the students, the soil is your plant's home. Um, if your plant, if your home is, is it's organized and it's not crowded with, with the weeds here, for example, with the Bermuda grass on the picture on the right, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna be a much happier plant. So we encourage uh, breaking up the soil as much as possible. There's a school of thought, there's a group, uh, some people do not till their soil, um, but I would recommend tilling your soil at the very least the first time that you're gonna plant uh, in any space. Uh, now, you can start in containers, like the container on the left, it's a clay pot, or you can do something like the container on the right, which is a raised bed. The, the container on the right is a 2-inch by 12-inch, 12-foot board that we've cut into four pieces, um, and we put it together into a, so it's 2 feet by 4 feet uh, bed, and it creates 8 square feet of planting space. Uh, at the garden sites, there's a little bit more. There's more than eight students, and so there's a little bit of there's a little bit of plants planted in between those square feet. feet. Um, but we recommend one square foot per space. Um, the the benefits of starting your plants in containers or in a raised bed like this, uh, aside from it looking looking nice, it's also going to keep weeds and grasses at bay. Um, and then there's also if you don't have uh, containers, if you don't have if you don't want to have a raised bed, if you have space in your backyard. You can start doing in-ground rows. You can double dig a trench. And basically, you start by digging one layer um, of soil out. And then you move it to the side and you dig out another layer. Um, you can find a great amount of resources on the internet about double digging, uh, it, the double digging method, in order to prepare your trench. Another thing that we recommend as well is if you notice in the picture in the middle, this is a garden site that uh, our local master gardener, Vince Sueta, used to work at. There is straw bale mulch all about all around here in this area. And we recommend mulching your soil or at least around mulching around your beds. Um, and the benefit of this straw bale mulch or maybe uh, wood chip mulch is that it's going to maintain the temperature of the soil. It's going to maintain the moisture in there. Um, it's going to prevent weeds from sprouting up, and it's also going to keep your shoes less muddy um, as you're walking about the garden. Um, and it promotes it promotes microbial life to to spread out a little bit further. Um, let me clear my drawings, and we'll keep going. Um, if you have any questions, we're going to try to take them all at the very end. So the very last thing for soil is. Uh, sometimes you can go to the store and you can buy a bag of soil, a potting soil, but there's not a whole lot of beyond organic matter there's not a whole lot of nutrients in that soil so the same way that humans need their fruits and vegetables protein dairy and grains uh, and their vitamins and nutrients from those foods plants need uh, essential nutrients as well so the main nutrients you're going to see on the screen are the nitrogen uh, potassium and phosphorus the n the p and the k so make sure that when you're buying about a bag of potting soil at the very back you're going to look for a small percentage uh, where it indicates that it has nitrogen, phosphorus, available potash, or, or potassium. Um, extremely important for your plants. Plants have two stages of life. They have a vegetative state and a fruiting state. 
in the first stage of life, you're going to give them as much nitrogen as possible if you're feeding them uh, through a liquid foliar spray or if you're amending the soil. You want to give your plants as much nitrogen. So if you plant your tomato or your watermelon, it during the first two weeks to the first two months of its life, when it's growing green, green, lush stems and leaves, you want to give it nitrogen. And then once their flowers come out and they start getting pollinated and a little fruit starts to come out, you want to cut that nitrogen and you want to give it the P and the K if you're feeding your plants regularly, um, at least once, once in a while. Um, it's going to help your plants, your fruit come out a lot bigger and stronger. Sometimes if you, if your plants don't have the P and the K, if they don't have phosphorus and potassium and calcium and all their other nutrients, they might grow green lush life. You might have a big bushy tomato without any fruit or the fruit might come out a little bit uh, smaller deformed. So it's very important to have essential nutrients in your soil. If you can, if you can put it, if you can find it in the potting bags of soil that you, that you buy. Um, so you have your soil, it's ready to go. It's been tilled and plowed, it's been amended. It's either in a container or it's in, a, in an in-ground trench or it's in a raised box. Now you're gonna have to start your seeds or you can buy transplants. Now seeds are much less expensive. Um, a bag of seed, uh, one, like the one on the screen, maybe it's 99 cents, 2.99. One of those transplants might at the bottom might be 299 by itself or more i think 365 is the last time that i saw it at uh, one of the larger big box stores uh, nurseries so it's much faster to start with transplants you're going to have immediate satisfaction it's going to look good right away um, you're going to have a faster production time um, it's much easier um, it's a little bit more gratifying immediately but seeds are going to be a little bit more of a richer experience if you start with them uh, they're a it's a little bit more challenging, uh, but a slightly more rewarding, at least at the very least in my, from my experience. Um, it's a numbers game. Some seeds are going to die, but it's like riding a bicycle. You know, the, the first times that you plant your seeds, you're going to fall off. Some seeds are going to die. Some, some plants are not going to make it, but it's important that you get back on your bicycle, replant some seeds, um, and learn from your experiences. Um, and yeah, so some seeds can be sowed directly on the ground, on your bed, on the bed that you prepared. Other seeds can be drilled um, into the ground. And so you can broadcast on the screen on the top, it shows a, an image of a hand broadcasting seeds. I personally like to broadcast any root vegetables like your carrots, your beets, your radishes, your turnips. All those root vegetables can be broadcast. Certain leafy greens like your spring mix and your lettuces can be broadcast onto your bed as well. Um, seeds that I drill directly into the soil are seeds that are physically large, like larger than a pinky, that like the size of your uh, of your of your fingernail. Um, so seeds like your peas, your corn, your pumpkins, uh, sunflower seeds, anything that's physically large, beans, all that stuff you can drill directly in the soil, um, but no more no more than an inch and a half, from about half an inch. Um, depending on the seed variety. And most of the time, you're going to have instructions on the depth uh, for each particular variety. Now, if you're starting seeds in transplant containers, uh, some do better in transplant containers, a little bit more delicate plants like your peppers, you might want to start in a transplant container like the ones you see on the screen. You can do something as simple as recycled uh, milk, milk cartons, soda containers, making sure that you make hole, poke holes in the very bottom to drain out the soil. Um, you can also use your recycled berry containers to germinate your seeds. And then one thing, one strategy we utilize at the, at the preschool sites is we'll have milk cartons with a plastic film over the top and that creates the conditions of a mini greenhouse. Uh, and what are the conditions of a mini greenhouse? It, there's moist, there's sunlight, uh, it's warm uh, and those seeds are going to be protected as they sprout. Once they sprout, they remove the plastic film. Or you can do something a little bit fancier like the lights on the on the shelving racks over here on this side of the screen. Um, as, a, as a side note, your plants need between 70 and 85 degrees of temperature in order to germinate and to pop and to sprout. Um, 80 degrees is the optimum temperature for your plant. So you might 
sometimes like if we planted maybe some seeds outside a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, and it was a little bit too hot, they could have died when they were they were very tiny. Um, so if you're if you started seeds already and they died, I would rec encourage you to replant them again now that it's a little bit cooler. We are in that planting window right now. Um, where you can get a lot of things into the ground uh, or into transplant containers. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of your seed varieties are going to have instructions, specific instructions in the back, uh, the days for germination, when you should plant it for specific regions. Now, once you have your transplant containers and you have your, your seeds growing, you want to make sure that you're using a square foot garden method. So we're, we're giving vegetable plants at least one square foot of space. If you have herbs, we're going to change the the recommendations for that and we'll, and we'll send you a, a PDF with the specific um, requirements for herbs. But your soil should cover the root, the, your roots. You should avoid grasping the, I know in this picture in the back, they're grabbing the, the root bulb with their fingers. I would avoid grasping the roots with your hands. You want to hold your plants from the stem you want to look out when you're purchasing transplants, you want to look out for white roots as opposed to those brown roots that may be a little bit root bound. If you want to save those root bound plants, you can still dip that root bound, uh, this brown here. You can dip this into water for about six to 12 hours and then try and transplant it afterwards. Um, that oftentimes will, will loosen up the roots and it's easier to transplant. When you transplant, you want to make sure you dig a hole that's at least twice the size of your container two to three times the size would be recommended. You don't want to, you don't want to bury your stem. You don't want to bury, you don't want to bend the root ball sideways. And you also don't want to expose the root ball to the outside surface. You want to cover it completely flush. One thing that my grandmother does and she taught me is if you don't pat it down at the stem, when you water, those plants might pop back up and they might flow and fall to the side. So it's very important that you press down on the soil just a little bit um, so that they're able to hold themselves up. It's best to transplant at dusk and at dawn. So in the early morning or in the evening, so you can give your tra your, your transplants a little bit of time to adjust. Um, that's it's also the best time to water is uh, in the in early morning and the evening. Uh, and we'll get to that right now. So there's many ways you guys can water. Your plants are gonna require Differing levels of irrigation depending on the time of year and the variety. For the most part, you want to make you want to keep soil moist, like a wrung out sponge, not soggy but not dry either. So, if on the bed on the right, if you want to check for moisture, you can dig your two fingers into the edge of that bed. If more than two, if the first two inches are dry, you can go ahead and water that bed. If it's only about half an inch of the topsoil is dry, then you can go ahead and leave it for a day to, to dry out a little bit more. If roots receive water in the same, if roots receive water every single day, they're going to have no incentive to grow. They're just going to receive water in the same location. They'll stay and they'll spoil. If you allow the soil to dry just a tad bit, it's going to promote a little bit of root growth. The, the roots will start to stretch out looking for water, and that's going to help them grow. You can water through foliar spray, uh, which is uh, you know, you can water the leaves by foliar spraying them through through a, a bunch of different techniques. Um, you can have your finger on the hose if you'd like, or you can buy something for a hose attachment. Um, if your hose can't reach, you can buy, you can have different sorts of sprayers, like the picture on the bottom left. If you're drenching your roots, I would rec. so you can foliar spray, honestly, every once a day is okay. We recommend at dusk or at dawn. Um, that's when you're plants leaves are most uh, adept at absorbing moisture. Uh, at dusk and at dawn, your plants pores are going, the cells pores are going to open up a little bit more and they're more able to absorb water. In the middle of the day, at noon, one o'clock, you don't want to necessarily water your leaves, even if it's super hot. That, even though you, you want to help maybe a plant that's wilting, you want to, watering during the middle of the day can harm your plants. Um, the droplets of the water can, can act as tiny magnifying glasses and it can actually burn the leaves. Um, it's also evaporating at a very fast rate and so your plant doesn't necessarily benefit from watering in the middle of the day. It's going to benefit if you water early in the morning or late in the evening. Um, now moving on to drenching your roots. You don't want to root, drench your roots every single day. You want to let that soil dry just a tad bit. 
Um, but when you do, you can drench with a handheld watering container or a recycled watering container. If you're going out of town, you can get one of these fancy globes that we see on the screen, or you can buy, you can do a recycled uh, plastic bottle with holes on the bottom and you're, and you're watering passively. And if you're leaving for a very long time, or if you have um, the ability to do this, uh, Labrucher Irrigation Supply helped us set this up. And it's a very simple, not super expensive uh, system, and you can add a timer to it. Um, and it helps save you a lot of time and energy um, as far as watering your plants. Um, and I so six to eight hours of sunlight, your plants are in there. If you need to prune your trees, make sure a lot of people sometimes will, they'll plant near their tree underneath it. And we suggest not to do that. You want to have full sunlight at the very least six to eight hours of sunlight uh, for any vegetable crops that you're trying to grow. Um, cool. So we have a planting calendar right now. At this moment, you can we are, we're in a window where you can plant anything and everything that you need for a salad. So all your leafy greens, your spinach, your kale, your lettuce, but also your brassicas, your broccoli, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, your collard greens. Um, you can get your roots vegetables in, your carrots, your um, your beets, your turnips, your radishes, like we mentioned earlier. Um, in the warm season. Starting in February, you can get things like everything that you need for a salsa. So your chile, tomate, cebolla, your peppers, your tomatoes, those grow great in the spring. Um, now, some gardeners that I've met are able to grow tomatoes, cherry tomatoes specifically, in the Imperial Valley almost year round uh, by mulching their soil and providing a little bit of shade um, during the hot summer months. And then by mulching, the soil and then providing a little bit of a cover over them in the cold, cold winter months, uh, you can, you're able to keep some tomato plants alive. Some people are able to grow tomatoes year round, but we would recommend planting them uh, in February so they grow throughout the spring. Um, awesome. So you have your plants in the ground, you prepped your soil, you, you germinated your seeds, you got them in the ground, they're growing and an insect is now attacking them. One of the things you can do, one of the main things that attacks our insects in the Imperial Valley is our white flies. I'm not uh, an integrated pest management expert, but we recommend introducing beneficial microbes. On Amazon, you can go and purchase a thousand ladybugs uh, for about $15 and they arrive within two to three days in a little open box and you can spread those in your garden and they prey on the, on the white fly and the aphids that eat your plants. Uh, so we highly recommend this. There's going to be more information on integrated pest management um, and your plant diseases in the future webinar. Um, and I want to share with you a quick video of harvesting bell peppers in uh, my parents' backyard garden last spring. Uh, it's very possible to grow a lot of different varieties of things in the Imperial Valley. We just have to start um, and so we encourage you to, to get started at home and to start either with herbs or with your vegetables. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. So we can, I think we can take questions at